Okay, let's start. Um, uh, greetings. My name is Oleg Petrov. I'm uh, with the World Bank uh, Washington DC office, uh, and I will be moderating this uh, session on digital resilience in Eurasia, sustaining and securing digital transformation in the age of COVID-19. Uh, this event is part of the Strategy State and IT Eurasian Forum. We're happy to partner with Strategist on this event. And this event is also uh, being organized uh, with partial support from the Korea World Bank Partnership Facility. It is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, our uh, topic and uh, our very distinguished uh, uh, set of uh, speakers. Uh, the topic uh, of digital resilience in Eurasia is, uh, is a very hot subject these days. Uh, uh, due to COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis, uh, the role of uh, digital and the role of resilience uh, has become critical. And together, this resilience is even more critical agenda for uh, many of our clients. And today we have several of them. And we also have uh, very distinguished international experts. Uh, and I will just mention all of them uh, before we uh, start with the opening remarks uh, by our regional director, Sebastian Molineos, uh, regional director for South Caucasus at the World Bank at the Lisi office. So let me, uh, I will not be providing detailed introduction of the topic, uh, my colleagues will, but I will just say that this event is uh, important part of the series of uh, knowledge sharing events for which World Bank is organizing on the topics of digital transformation, digital resilience. Uh, we've, we've done several such events recently and uh, we're very happy to uh, have a new set of topics for discussion, uh, which will be introduced shortly. Uh, and let me um, uh, again mention the panelists which are here today with us. So I already mentioned uh, Sebastian Molineos who will provide the opening remarks. Uh, we also have a uh, keynote speaker, Rafael Hazinski from SecDev Group. Uh, World Bank has engaged the uh, SecDev Group to uh, support uh, our uh, new initiative on digital resilience in Central Asia focused on Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, and Rafael and his team have been doing research and uh, analysis of the uh, conceptual and strategic uh, aspects of uh, digital resilience and uh, writing a report on this. So we will hope to hear initial uh, findings from, uh, from their research. Uh, we also have Melissa Hathaway, who is a former cybersecurity advisor uh, to George Bush and Barack Obama administrations, a very distinguished uh, expert on cybersecurity and digital risk management, overall digital resilience. So very, very pleased to have Melissa with us. Uh, and we also have uh, our key clients from Kyrgyzstan, uh, uh, Mr. Altenbeck Ismailov, the chairman of the State Committee of Information Technology and Communications. Uh, welcome, Altenbeck. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, and we also have uh, another uh, senior client uh, from Central Asia, Mr. Arman Abdrasilov, uh, chair of the National Infocommunication Holding Zerde. Congratulations on your new appointment, uh, Arman. And we also have Babur Abdullayev, uh, Rector of Amity University in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Welcome, Babur. And uh, last but not least, we have Irakli Grenitadze, uh, who was the chairman of Georgian Data Exchange Agency, and now he's a global uh, digital government expert uh, who worked a lot on Central Asia and other regions. Uh, welcome, Irakli. Uh, so uh, we will have about an hour for this panel. Uh, uh, we'll start, as I said, with the opening remarks, the brief opening remarks by our regional director. Um, we will have a keynote address from Rafael Arzinski uh, for about 10 minutes. And then we'll have a moderated panel discussion uh, uh, on this topic of digital resilience uh, and how the region is uh, coping with the COVID-19 crisis through digital. Uh, and we'll have some uh, time for questions and answers uh, and open discussion at the end. So I'd like to ask all the speakers uh, to uh, stick to the uh, running order, which I just mentioned. So no more than five minutes for intervention from panelists. Uh, and so over to uh, now to our first speaker, Mr. Sebastian Molineos of your open remarks. Thank you, Sebastian. Well, thank you so much, um, Oleg and uh, your colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It is 
truly my, uh, my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the World Bank here to this panel on digital resilience and, and sustaining the digital transformation, uh, which is hosted by our digital development team um, with the support, as, as we have mentioned, Oleg, by the, uh, the Korea World Bank Partnership Facility and certainly the uh, strategist uh, in, in this forum as well. So it's a sincere thank you. Um, Look, I mean, perhaps no other single event has emphasized just how important the digital transformation is than, than the current COVID pandemic that, that we're living in. I mean, with, within a few weeks, month, really, our, our world has completely changed and the fundamentals that have driven economic growth and expansion over the past 40 years have, have completely shifted. It's like the rug has been you know, taken uh, you know, from, from under our feet. Um, we've seen that global mobility has been reduced uh, with some 20 to 30 percent of the, the population under lockdown. Um, Cybercrime, uh, individuals really leveraging the, the COVID pandemic for, for their own gains has increased exponentially. In fact, um, you know, I was just uh, you know, reading today that we've seen a 273 percent increase in cyber breaches, a 600 percent increase in COVID-themed malware attacks during the first two quarters of 2020 alone. Um, we see global supply chains that are at risk with businesses really reevaluating you know, their, their risk uh, you know, strategies. And, uh, and we see businesses, governments, and just ordinary citizens completely having to readjust um, you know, to these new conditions and into this, uh, into this normal, into this new normal. Um, and so there are real risks and, and, and changes that are about, but like we all know, there, you know, this also brings certain opportunities uh, with us. Uh, I, like, I, like I always like to say, you know, this, uh, you know, the digital transformation not, may not be a silver bullet, but it certainly, I think, is, is a golden opportunity to, to really bring about some, some important changes. And, and in some ways, we're, we're seeing this play out as, as we speak, perhaps. And, and the world has already taken this amazing, giant digital leap, for, for lack of a better word. And, so, and to highlight, within six months, we have moved more than five years ahead um, in, in the digital adoption. Um, look, telecom operators uh, right now are reporting a 40 to 50 percent increase in the use of wireless data networks. Um, the use of video conferencing, like like we're doing right now, has increased, uh, you know, by, by over 700 percent. Not always for for the better, as we know, and those of us who spend all day, it seems like, in, in video conferences, but it allows us to connect much more seamlessly, perhaps than uh, than, than was the case before. And, and we see that around the world, again, businesses, governments, individuals have completely shifted their work from, uh, from you know, sort of from real life, quote unquote, to, to online, perhaps only temporarily. Who knows, uh, you know, what a, a vaccine may bring. But I personally believe that, you know, some of these changes that we've seen um, are going to be here for, for, the, for the medium to long term. And I do also believe that there is going to be a new normal and increasingly digital world. And I don't think that we're gonna go back to the way things that, that were done before. Um, and, and this, I believe, really requires completely new thinking, a new mindset. And my, I, even better than a mindset, a mind shift that, that needs to take place. New approaches, how businesses are run, how they treat their employees, how governments um, interact with their, with their citizens. Um, and individuals indeed with one another as well. So I do see huge opportunities for us all to embrace, uh, again, the digital transformation uh, for, for the betterment. Um, and, um, you know, it's, um, it's particularly when you look at some of the use cases during the COVID you know, e uh, pandemic, you look at e-learning or telemedicine that would never have been possible um, during the times of the Spanish flu or influenza, but now are a real, you know, opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to reach, you know, individuals in rural villages and to increasingly connect and to, and to uh, sort of combat some of the economic dualism that exists in, in many societies around the world. Um, and, and we see that there are some countries, digital leaders in South Korea, to name one, Georgia, and, you know, in fact, in the country that I'm based in here, but many others across the ECA region, um, we've seen that countries, you know, have demonstrated that it is possible to contain sort of the, the impact of COVID and secure economic prosperity through a combination, again, of informed leadership, trust, integrity, and investments into resilience and, and the digital transformation agenda. And again, this is not, a, as I said, a silver bullet out of this global crisis, but to my mind, it is part of the answer um, and, and a good, again, a golden opportunity. Now, 
we at the World Bank, we've been working hand in glove with governments and with, through our, uh, the, our, our partner, our sister institution, the IFC, with, with businesses around the world. Um, one project that I'm really proud of um, that, that we um, were able to uh, deliver in, in record time is, is Login Georgia, where we are able now to connect up to 500,000 individuals in rural and remote areas in up to 1,000 villages who have been completely cut off from sort of broadband internet and with the aim of providing them with um, affordable broadband internet, connecting them um, again to uh, economic and, and other um, opportunities or be it e-learning or, or uh, other um, digital use cases. And there are other initiatives that Digital Central Asia and South Asia initiative and really initiatives around the world that we've been supporting that I think are really critical and important pillar uh, to government's response uh, to the COVID um, pandemic and, and in making societies really more resilient and, and safeguarding some of these digital opportunities. And uh, again, I'm conscious of time, I'm already slightly over. So I just want to perhaps conclude by saying, I think this is a wake up call um, for us to really embrace some of the opportunities. Let's not completely forget what has worked in the past, but again, let's at the same time use some of these shifts that are taking place and take advantage um, of them. Um, know that the World Bank stands uh, as a partner by governments and, and really everyone's side in terms of uh, you know, transitioning to this, uh, to this new world. And uh, we really would like to do so in full partnership. We don't you know, pretend to have all the answers, uh, but certainly uh, through our advisory work or our uh, financing work and our convening, I think that we can play an important role and we'd be happy to continue to do so. So thank you so much uh, for your time, true pleasure, and look forward to the discussion. I will unfortunately have to leave a bit earlier uh, through a previous commitment, but I really didn't want to uh, effectuate these uh, opening remarks. So thank you, uh, Oleg, back over to you. Thank you, Sebastian, uh, excellent uh, start of the session, uh, thanks to you. So we will now move into our next uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Afar uh, uh who is the CEO of SecDev Group uh, in Canada, uh, and uh, he's been a, a partner for the World Bank on um, uh, doing the initial uh, analysis and research uh, on uh, digital resilience uh, related themes uh, for the focus of Central Asia. So we hope to hear from him uh, the latest uh, thinking uh, from his team on this topic and uh, which, what, is the, what are the priorities and uh, what is the potential framework we should be looking at as, as we prioritize our you know, actions and support governments in this area. Over to you, uh, Rafal, you know, please take no more than 10 minutes. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Oleg. And then thank you very much, Sebastian, for some excellent opening remarks. Uh, without restating much of what you said, I think it's important to recognize that COVID really does represent an unprecedented challenge to the global system, and one that uh, we may look back upon uh, for, uh, at 2020, much in the same way as we did the years following World War II, when the global order was transformed. Uh, within a very few short months, fundamental features of the global uh, system, including air travel, supply chains, uh, sustaining trade, have been radically fragmented and reordered. While a small number of countries have quickly recovered, most have closed down their borders and everyday life is being profoundly disrupted through closures and lockdowns. Um, economic costs are severe and just getting started. Uh, the World Bank projected a decline of 5.2% of global GDP. Some others have pro provided much higher figures and international trade will contract over 30% in 2020, according to the WTO. Uh, making matters worse, COVID is occurring at a time of heightened global tensions, trade wars and tariffs. The pandemic arrived precisely at the moment when international cooperation was most needed to deal with not just infection diseases, but a myriad of global challenges from climate change to nuclear threats to cyber war. Perhaps most fascinating, COVID is fundamentally rewiring the global commons. Since it started spreading in 2019, COVID-19 has accelerated digital transformation of countries, corporations, and societies, and the reasons are pretty straightforward. With the imposition of lockdowns, restrictions, and physical distancing, People have been forced to work remotely, access services online, and communicate principally through digital means. Dependence and the use of cloud computing will increase between 12 and 22% in 2020. And not surprisingly, video conferencing such as services such as Zoom have seen their corporate valuations climb to unprecedented heights. And this growing dependence on all things digital also has a very dark side. As Sebastian has already said, of uh, cybercrime, including ransomware attacks against critical infrastructure, hospitals, companies, and government services is soaring. Last month, the entire border and customs service of Argentina was held at ransom by one such attack. It's hard to determine 
who will be the digital winners and losers of this pandemic as everyone has suffered, although people and countries have been affected differently. Even so, six months into this strange new COVID era, we can start to see some lessons emerging about how to navigate these new turbulent waters. One particularly stands out. Early and sustained investment into digital transformation prepared some countries better than those that did not. Digital leaders such as Estonia, Singapore, South Korea, and the UAE rapidly adapted their government, businesses, and societies when the pandemic hit. Precisely because their citizens were digitally literate, public authorities could adapt and extend services ranging from health to education to the online environment. The digital agility of these countries didn't emerge out of thin air. They already had implemented the necessary legal and regulatory frameworks to secure their digital assets. As a result, they were perfectly situated to roll out new applications to track and trace the spread of COVID-19 while simultaneously protecting the privacy of their citizens. Many of the best performance also had business continuity plans already in place before the pandemic hit. That meant that public and private institutions could smooth the frictions generated by lockdowns, respond to failures in the network, and simultaneously counter and determine, deter opportunistic cyber criminal activity. Let me be clear. Countries that had successfully undergone digital transformation were digitally resilient. They were best placed to be to prevent, respond to, and recover from COVID-19 precisely because they were digitally prepared. They were also ideally situated to innovate in the face of uncertainty. The message is clear. Invest in digital transformation and invest now. So what is digital resilience? At its most fundamental level, digital resilience is a mindset as well as a set of strategies, policies and practices that safeguard digital governance and the digital economy. Digital resilience is a measurable concept, one that entails a degree of readiness to adapt to and recover from short-term shocks and longer-term stresses. Digital resilience is not limited to cybersecurity, although the capacity to safeguard digital infrastructure is a core attribute. Digital resilience is an all-of-society concept that takes into account human, institutional, and digital stability. Now, digital resilience has three core attributes, operational continuity, cybersecurity, and data protection and privacy. So first, let's look at operational continuity. Operational continuity is the capacity to reliably manage, recover from, and adapt to conditions of adversity. COVID-19 has disrupted governance and commerce with people forced to distance and rely on digital technologies. Essential services such as healthcare, medicine, are being reimagined and delivered digitally. Operational continuity means planning and preparing for the inevitability of crises. It means leveraging investments in digital transformation in order to drive institutional innovation. At a minimum, it entails sustaining vital services and economic activity to enable pathways towards recovery. Second, cybersecurity consists of the standards, practices, and workforce that safeguard the national digital ecosystem. This includes national computer emergency and computer incident response teams, risk frameworks for assessing and preemptively managing threats and vulnerabilities, and a tested capability to respond to national incidents ranging from failures and accidents through to deliberate attacks against critical infrastructure and other mass cyber events. Cybersecurity is a critical feature of digital resilience precisely because digital governance and the digital economy are so dependent on hardware and software systems of systems. There's a growing dependence on investors and infrastructures, including cloud computing resources that reside outside of the physical jurisdiction of nation states. Finally, digital resilience is reliant on data privacy and data protection. The rules of how data is collected, used, and safeguarded from unauthorized access. Data is the currency of value in the digital economy and the critical resource for effective governance. Privacy and protection are more than just a matter of citizen rights. Ensuring trust and integrity in digital systems is singularly important and foundational to public administration, commercial transactions, and accountable and representative government. Now, over the past six months, we've been witness to the world's largest ever natural experiment, 
we've had the opportunity to observe how these three core enablers, operational continuity, cybersecurity, and data privacy and data protection have operated in practice. And the experience of South Korea is particularly worth noting. You see, South Korea was one of the first countries to register a COVID-19 outbreak. It also flattened the curve in a stunning fashion. The country has registered over 22,000 cases, but fewer than 360 deaths. What makes South Korea's experience so impressive is that it did this without closing businesses or forcing everyone to stay at home. Now, South Korea is not out of the woods and there are still challenges as we've seen, but it stands out as an exemplary case. Among the many factors that contributed to their relative success are the ways that the public officials, scientists and citizens collaborated to detect, contain and treat vulnerable people. Testing and health capacities rapidly surged, including in hotspots like Daegu. But the secret to South Korea's success also resides in its digital resiliency. So what happened? When COVID-19 was first detected, the South Korean government mobilized its digital assets to positive effect. It invested in new solutions for screening and diagnosis and rolled out self-health check apps and GPS-based tools to enforce quarantines. The public authorities also repurposed existing technologies like CCTV and sensor infrastructure used to monitor traffic and pollution. It likewise encouraged mask wearing and worked with the private sector partners to design apps to improve distribution. Within weeks of discovering the virus, South Korea had mobilized digital tools to improve diagnostics, strengthen telemedicine, and make data available to improve domestic awareness and response. It was was not just implying these innovations locally, it was also exporting them around the world. As a result, South Korea quickly recovered and now is in pole position to take advantage of the burgeoning digital economy. The government greased the wheels by making rent relief and financial credits available to small and medium enterprises. A number of ministries stepped up collaboration with the private sector to do everything from dramatically expand the export of test kits to strengthen outreach and support for remote working. Meanwhile, the government also supported rapid online schooling opportunities, including providing over 3,300 smart devices and free internet services to low-income family and students. South Korea's experience is a stark reminder of the importance of cultivating digital resilience in a digitizing world. The ability not just to ensure continuity of services when shock hits, but also to bounce back, learn and improve. That's the trademark of smart governance in the 21st century. It's not enough just to strive, survive crises and keep services functioning, including online. As I've already said, digital resilience is a strategy, mindset, and set of behaviors. It is a down payment on a more secure future, which explains why South Korea is racing ahead to build a digital new deal organized around 5G, artificial intelligence, and data protection. Now, not every country can be South Korea, but they can learn from its experience and apply its lessons domestically. The countries of Central Asia are at the threshold of embarking on a new phase of digital transformation and building a decidedly Eurasian digital economy. They'll do so in the midst of an extraordinary adversity and crisis. We cannot underestimate the challenges ahead. But unlike first movers like South Korea, they'll benefit from the experience of digital leaders. They can apply these insights to their own context. There are clearly many more lessons to be learned and the pathways to recovering from COVID-19 requires more than just digital transformation. Informed, competent leadership, trust in science and facts, intelligent governance are all determinants of success. We need them now more than ever. Although uncertainty is inevitable, future pandemics, climate disasters, and cyber threats are not. Let me simply conclude by saying that digital resilience is a pathway to safeguarding these future digital opportunities. And on that, I'd like to thank you and over to you, Oleg. Thank you so much, Rafal, uh, for a very inspirational uh, keynote speech, uh, which uh, nailed down, I think, the key points very well. So I have not much to add except I want to emphasize your message that now is the time to invest in digital transformation, digital resilience. I think we've all learned uh, that lesson. Many learn it the hard way. 
that if you're not prepared for the next shock, you know, you will be, you know, in big trouble. And I think a lot of countries are, you know, suffering as a result. So, and this is what World Bank uh, Digital Development Global Practice is all about. We're here to work with our clients, our partners in various countries to invest in the foundations of digital transformation, digital resilience. In fact, we have several of them today. And we hope during the panel discussion, which will follow now, uh, hear from the challenges and uh, lessons learned and the uh, next steps, the plans they're making to uh, both manage the current crisis and to prepare for the next crisis uh, better. Uh, I think uh, this is a very important topic, uh, very timely, uh, and I'm very pleased that we have such a distinguished uh, panel today, which uh, I'd like to uh, reintroduce one by one. We will go with um, uh, ladies first, you know, if, I, if I may say so. Melissa Hathaway uh, is probably one of the top, I don't know, top five, top ten uh, global e uh, digital security digital risk uh, experts. Uh, she was the, one of the authors of the US cybersecurity strategy and worked very closely uh, with the uh, presidential administrations uh, of George Bush and Barack Obama on cybersecurity. So uh, Melissa uh, is, uh, has done, done a lot of global research recently. She's teaching at Harvard Kennedy School. And uh, you know, we hope that, uh, we hope to hear from, from you, Melissa. Uh, what has changed in the COVID era uh, with respect to cybersecurity threat and risk environment. What countries have responded more successfully and why? Why a broader approach to digital risk and safeguards is warranted? Uh, and you only have five minutes uh, to handle those. Uh, thank you, Melissa, over to you. Thank you, Oleg, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. And, um, and I, I do think that the COVID experience that we're all having, we're at the six month mark for many of our countries, maybe it's the nine month mark for, um, for Asia Pacific, uh, but it has underscored the importance of telecommunications infrastructure, which is the backbone that enables our digital economy. And it shows where even the countries that have very strong telecommunications capacity have um, become vulnerable to the uh, fragility of the software and hardware products that we've embedded in them that are inherently vulnerable. Uh, and from March to June, we saw a 1200% increase of all of our countries using these collaborative tools like Zoom, et cetera, to keep us connected in a, now a disconnected society. And through that, we also saw um, the increase in distributed denial of service attacks, increase of over 700% in ransomware attacks. And when we need to be online doing business or online for school, we're being knocked offline by these malicious activities. We're also seeing the increase of nation states actually bringing down our infrastructures for harm, stealing our intellectual property, and actually manipulating the research that's so important for our recovery um, in this pandemic and for the research of the drugs and the actual vaccines. As uh, Rafal said, we have seen an 8% decline in the global economy um, and, uh, and that is without actually even recording the different uh, problems that we're seeing with the uh, with the um, ransomware, distributed denial of service, et cetera. So when I start to see uh, what countries are handling it right, I, I do think it's really quite remarkable um, what, how Korea has, um, has led through this, um, this initiative or, um, and sees it as an opportunity. As Rafal said, the Digital New Deal was announced um, and it was uh, funded at over 130 billion US. And it's to take advantage of this crisis and build a contactless or uncontact um, uh, industries in order to help us survive going forward because things will not ever return to what we had uh, nine months ago. So on the backbone of 5G, on the backbone of artificial intelligence and um, underscoring the need for data protection, What's missing out of many of our um, conversations of our society is the need for resilience and for better hardware and software products to be that backbone of our um, infrastructure. We talk about 5G, but we don't talk about 5G cybersecurity. 
we talk about telemedicine, but we don't talk about how we're going to secure telemedicine. We talk about smart agriculture, but we don't talk about how I can take over those sensors in the fields for our crops or those sensors in the um, driverless vehicles. And we talk about the um, advanced manufacturing floors where we're going to have uh, lights out factories and robots, but we don't talk about how we're going to secure those robots or what happens when those robots get ransomed. And my manufacturing floor is now offline when it needed to be online. So as I start to look at this, um, there, are, um, there are no countries talking about resilience as they talk about their digital strategy. They're, they are adopting digital strategies and not having a commensurate conversation about security and resilience. So I think this is why this is so important that we're talking about digital resilience in Central Asia as you start to actually fund for the broadband and move your communities from 40% to 70% or 80% connected, as you invest in the new industries, the contactless or uncontact industries, that you start to invest commensurately in the security and resilience of those infrastructures and of those services. And it is, in my opinion, the down payment for your own digital transformation. It would be a shame to see us to actually invest in the broadband, invest in these industries and only make our countries more fragile. If you start to look at the fragility, you have New Zealand's uh, stock exchange has been knocked offline for a few weeks. You see the United States telecommunication infrastructure being knocked offline for 12 to 18 hours. And we're first world countries who have already developed in many of these areas, but we did not invest in the security and resilience. So it was my, I advocate that it's now's the time if you're going to have that digital transformation, make the resilience and security of your infrastructure top of mind and top of conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. Indeed, a very important reminder to make uh, security and resilience uh, top uh, issues for any digital strategy today. And uh, I'm sure that our uh, countries, uh, our country clients uh, represented here are already doing it. So we, we hope to hear from them on this very topic uh, very shortly. Uh, so the next uh, uh, speaker uh, is uh, our uh, partner and client uh, from Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, Mr. Altenbeck uh, uh, is my year. Altenbeck uh, uh, has had a distinguished career uh, in the public and private sector. More recently, uh, he worked in the head of the IT park of Kyrgyz Republic. So he has a strong background also in developing digital entrepreneurship, IT sector. And now he is the uh, minister level uh, digital leader of, for Kyrgyzstan and uh, our key partner for Digital CASA, Digital Central Asia, South Asia program, which is an investment uh, program uh, supported by the World Bank. And in fact, we're in the midst of our implementation support mission right now with Altenbeck's team. So uh, Altenbeck, I would like to ask you, Kyrgyzstan recently launched its ambitious program of digital transformation, and just as COVID-19 crisis was starting. What has the country done uh, well to ensure stronger digital resilience in the past six months? And what are your plans for the next six months? Over to you, Altenbeck. Thank you so much, Alec. Uh, I'm very happy to be among the panelists who are really distinguished and knowledgeable about digital resilience topics. So, uh, so since we are talking about COVID, uh, despite its so many negative consequences, I think one positive thing is that uh, the realizations that we were right. We were right all the way in terms of introducing digital transformation to the country. We were not complacent about semi-automatic uh, digital services that the government is providing. And we uh, pushed for all automatization from the beginning till the end. And in the last, year, in the last months, we worked hard in order to introducing fully automated government services uh, with uh, suitable uh, united identification and authorization uh, systems and with uh, all the uh, with taking into account all the digital privacy issues and digital privacy controlling uh, tools uh, within our uh, 
uh, government services platform. We were right about uh, stimulating IT sector and IT, uh, uh, IT knowledge building uh, skills by providing special tax regimes. Because during the COVID uh, pandemic, we were able to mobilize IT uh, uh, community in order to uh, develop uh, so many IT tools that helped us to decrease the consequences of the COVID. We were right about uh, investing into uh, telecommunications uh, and by the report of UN e government report, uh, particularly uh, the telecommunication development index has increased by 73%. Uh, we were right about, uh, about stimulating uh, to all the government agencies to connect with each other. We have developed a Tunduk system which essentially unites and ensures interconnectivity between different government agencies. So there are so many things uh, to talk about and there are so many ways of doing digital transformation right or wrong. And, and looking forward, uh, we are thinking about that we are more cognizant about what we are doing right now. Of course, digital resilience is a topic that became uh, more prominent right now. We are thinking about how to ensure uh, continuity of the government services, of the businesses, continuity of education sector, and also health system. And obviously these uh, uh, directions will be priority, uh, but we are uh, already uh, thinking about uh, starting digital resilience program in the partnership with the World Bank. And there we are identifying key critical uh, uh, topics that we need to address in a, in a soonest time. Within the digital CASA project right now, we are going to invest even more into connectivity, connecting more than 4,000 social uh, destinations. And uh, we are hoping that these investments will bring extra more resilience to our uh, citizens. So uh, to conclude, uh, I, am, uh, I think that the uh, leadership that emphasized digital transformation even in 2018 came, out, came about to be the right policy for the Kyrgyzstan. And it has indeed decreased so many consequences that COVID has brought to us. Thank you so much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer your question. Thank you very much, Alton Beck. Ex excellent uh, uh, sharing of this Kyrgyz success story, emerging success story in handling the COVID-19 digitally. Uh, I just wanted to uh, it, you know, share that Kyrgyz uh, Republic is my favorite client uh, for several reasons, but one of them is because they're the most open to innovation and to new ideas. And uh, we, the digital resilience program is first being piloted in Kyrgyz Republic because of that openness and flexibility to ex experiment with new concepts cutting edge stuff. So we've done this many times in Kyrgyz Republic. So thank you, Altenbeck uh, and, and Kyrgyz Republic in general for being such flexible and uh, open uh, partners for innovation. Um, so we will have uh, time for questions and answers at the end. So please, uh, if you're watching us online, uh, feel free to send your questions. Uh, we will try to bring your questions at the end of the session. Uh, thank you again. So then our next uh, panelist uh, is uh, our a uh, distinguished uh, client and partner from Kazakhstan. Uh, 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 we have um, Arman, uh, 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 Arman uh, uh, Abdrasilov, the chair of the National Infocommunication Holding Zerde, which is the uh, digital uh, economy, digital uh, transformation agency of uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, Arman, again, congratulations on uh, your new position. And uh, we have known you for many years as a leading uh, regional expert on cybersecurity. And I guess your appointment may mean something that, uh, you know, a top, uh, top guru on cybersecurity in Kazakhstan is now in charge of overall digital transformation, uh, uh, implementation of, of digital agenda of the country. So I would like to uh, ask you the following question. Uh, cybersecurity and digital resilience is a journey and not a destination. How can it be made sustainable at the national level? Are there new models that need to be looked at uh, that draw upon the experience of the private sector? What Kazakhstan has done to manage its digital resilience and cybersecurity risks during COVID-19 times? Over to you, Arman. 
Yeah, hello. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, yes, really, uh, it's a very nice question because uh, cybersecurity in private companies and cybersecurity in government is diff different things. Uh, for example, uh, you know, in pandemic uh, time, uh, our country tried, uh, tried to make social help for our uh, people. And uh, uh, when we are making the so social helping, we face with challenges because uh, high laws, we see high load for our e-government systems is increased extremely and uh, we faced with troubles with um, availability of our information system and and really you uh, we we know that uh, three basic system, uh, three basic uh, uh, things in cybersecurity is confidential confidentially in integrity and availability and of course uh, uh, our government always uh, was focusing for for confidentiality and integrity, but availability is uh, always was uh, not so uh, important because uh, in private companies, in for banks or, or other uh, big companies, uh, availability uh, uh, is if if uh, some services services is idling it's a big trouble for companies because a company can losing billion or million uh, dollars but for a government system it's not so troubles in in fact but right now we're trying to change this mind, mind mindset and right now we are changing politics of government for uh, availability is one of the base of cyber securities uh, and right now we are working hard with our uh, government uh, cyber security uh, stakeholders is committee of national security is uh, committee of informational security is our in our ministry and also with our working with our uh, with other uh, go government states and right now it's uh, right now uh, me making I'm making trouble for other government states because uh, before before me the availability is not was trouble but, uh, there were uh, uh, plan planet stops uh, because, uh, for example, Sunday or Saturdays uh, uh, often making the uh, works for updating or other things. And right now we are trying to make uh, this um, this works invisibly invisibly for users because uh, government have, has have work. Uh, with uh, services like commercial sectors and uh, have to uh, making pricing for uh, idling or services. That, that's all I want to talk to you. Thank you very much, Arman. Um, yeah, uh, I hope that we will have a chance to discuss this further, you know, at the end of the session. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to pass uh, to uh, our next, pass the floor to our next speaker. Uh, Mr. Babur Abdullayev, uh, who is director of uh, Amity University. It's a new university in uh, Uzbekistan, which uh, uh, is uh, growing by leaps and bounds, and it's, it's already very active and uh, very effective uh, in uh, uh, shared building the digital skills uh, of, of its students. Uh, and uh, I'd like to ask a following question to uh, uh, Babur. Um, Babur has been our partner in Uzbekistan for several years. In fact, he was our main uh, counterpart at the Ministry of ICT for Digital Casa Uzbekistan project uh, until he was uh, promoted to become the rector of the Amit University. So welcome to you, Babur. I'd like to ask you uh, the following. Digital skills are critical to digital transformation. What steps uh, and digital resilience, of course. Uh, what steps is Uzbekistan taking to build skills for digital resilience that are specific to the immediate needs of the COVID uh, emergency? And which data competencies are required? Knowing about your interest in data, open data, et cetera. Over to you, Babur. Thank you, Oleg. Um, good evening. I'm sorry for maybe uh, not good uh, view, but I'm on my trip in my, one of the regions in Uzbekistan and just doing it through my mobile phone. Sorry for that. I'm very happy to be the part of this event. Uh, and um, the, I, I would say that in Uzbekistan, we were, uh, we were preparing the 
so many things for this to be the uh, digital resilience country and uh, for example we were creating the legal aspects legal stones and data for a long time for three four years already and which is uh, i think that already uh, not bad uh, uh, what was the main idea to invest in it in uzbekistan it was the education and uh, th th this is the main region actually why my university was also, also created for example so MIT is uh, MIT is a uh, IT university in Tashkent, which, uh, which is uh, um, mainly prepare only the IT specialists. Uh, we have so many such universities, and uh, this is the uh, main idea was to create create the uh, the global education system for IT in Uzbekistan. And besides that, uh, we have uh, we are creating in the all of the, our regions uh, more, more than 200 uh, IT centers, separate IT centers, uh, which will give the free IT knowledge for all the people who, who are not covered with the universities with the uh, education. So they are preparing the IT specialists for free and in the regions. And also, uh, we have a big project called uh, uh, One Million Coders. So we are uh, trying our best to to uh, prepare to to be prepared for all the our future uh, IT resilience. And uh, we are trying to uh, educate uh, one million coders in Uzbekistan, which is a I understand that this is a good number. But uh, if we take at least good number, uh, we will prepare it. if even half of it, it will give us big boom in the IT. And uh, same with the, uh, we had uh, launched last year the IT park, uh, uh, where uh, more than 400 uh, residents are part of it. Uh, this is the companies which will create, uh, which are creating the real systems. And uh, uh, also, IT Park has uh, uh, it is own IT, uh, center which uh, prepares the IT specialists uh, also. So uh, the government is paying so much attention for the IT education in Uzbekistan, uh, and hope that uh, in the future we will get uh, a lot of a lot of new ideas and new uh, uh, be, to be prepared for dig, uh, digital resilience. And uh, we have learned the lesson that uh, during this COVID-19 uh, period, we have learned the lesson that the, if we don't share, I mean, the government uh, uh, institutions, state organizations, if they don't share each, uh, information to each other and make uh, all the data and uh, services digitally online, so uh, it will be uh, very hard to be the sustainable, uh, to have a sustainable economic growth. Uh, and this is the main idea, I think, which ha we had learned after this COVID-19. And uh, uh, because of it, for the future, we are now working on the project uh, preparation of the document for digital strategy, strategy uh, 2030. So, and uh, of course, it will include uh, uh, six months and two years period uh, strategies. Uh, and I, I'm part of this working group and I hope that this strategy will give us uh, a sustainable growth in the IT sphere also. Uh, so these two things are the main ideas now in Uzbekistan. Uh, the, uh, IT education and uh, be to be the prepared for the future uh, uh, digital resilience. And uh, thank you for, to uh, World Bank that we are now in our uh, way to launch our project on uh, uh, with the World Bank. And uh, uh, one of the uh, good ideas in this project, uh, I, I think. Uh, is the creation of the Center, Central Asian Data Institute. Actually, this institute, I hope in the future, will uh, give us uh, very good uh, ideas and the uh, data uh, which in the future will help us to create so many systems. And uh, 
it, it didn't. Uh, one more time, let me uh, say that we, after this COVID-19 and uh, uh, after all the problems we, which we had uh, and which is not digitalized, we had learned the lesson that digital resilience is one of the main ideas, main aspects for the sustainable development of the, uh, uh, economic growth. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Rabur, and, and thanks for mentioning about the Central Asia Data Institute, which I believe is a very important undertaking. And uh, if the, uh, Uzbekistan is interested in uh, developing it, we'll certainly be happy to support it for Digital Casa. And we uh, have similar uh, centers of excellence uh, being discussed in other Central Asian countries, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan. So we're very happy to have a network of such centers, including on digital resilience, which we're discussing now in, in, Kyrgy in Kyrgyzstan. So thank you so much, Babur. Um, last but not least, we have uh, a very distinguished uh, uh, speaker, expert uh, from Georgia, is a host country of the forum, uh, Irakli Gwenitadze. Uh, used to be our client, our World Bank uh, partner on digital uh, government uh, a long time ago. I don't remember wh when it was exactly, but he was a head of the Georgian Data Exchange Agency at that time. In the recent years, Iraqli has become a, a, a leading a regional and international expert on digital government. And we often see him in various countries we come to, including Kyrgyz Republic, as, a, as an expert on uh, digital government, interoperability, uh, frameworks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I'd like to ask Irakli the following question. As one of pillars of digital resilience, uh, business or operational continuity arose in importance as public services had to pivot rapidly to digital delivery under lockdowns caused by COVID-19. As a former CIO of the Georgian government, what lessons learned or key takeaways should public sector leaders look at uh, to prepare for the next emergency. In fact, uh, we already got a question from uh, 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 the audience, uh, which is similar to the last one. And this question to everyone in the panel, so you can start reflecting on it while Iraq is answering. The question was, if we knew a year ago that COVID uh, is coming, right? What would you have done differently to prepare better? So if, uh, if you can um, reflect on that while we ask Iraq the, the question I, ju I just asked. Uh, Iraq, over to you. Well, welcome to the panel. And thank you very much, Oleg. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for organizers uh, to organize such interesting event. Uh, regarding COVID-19 global pandemic and lockdown caused by COVID-19, once again, uh, confirmed Murphy's Law, which says anything can, uh, then can go wrong, goes wrong. So this is the reality what we have today. Uh, COVID-19 proposed new rules for life, for work, for teaching, for medicine, to whole world. The pandemic is transforming social attitudes and behaviors, and of course the work of state institutions. If a few years ago the idea of working from home seemed crazy or unreal and futuristic, when you, uh, now this is uh, already a reality and necessity. Uh, one of the most important tasks for Georgia over uh, all these years, along with the development of ICT infrastructure and online services, has been to increase the uh, number of uh, consumers of online, online services. This is your engagement of citizens concerned not only the ability of society to consume online services, such as availability of internet, or uh, personal computers or technical skills, but also the trust and reliability of the online services provided. Given the real, uh, reality of past years, uh, the war, of, uh, war with uh, Russia, the occupation territories, ongoing hybrid war, Georgia has paid significant attention to secure the state information systems. For, uh, uh, we, were think, we were thinking to, for sustainability of our systems. I would like to say that the telecommunications te sector here today in Georgia, state information systems, infrastructure, legislation are quite developed in Georgia. Of course, uh, we have a lot of problem in information cybersecurity still, but, uh, but and we have to working on this uh, direction. But if we are thinking about security starting point here, it's, it's risk assessment. In my opinion, 
this is a uh, starting point uh, from which we have to uh, we need to re-evaluate and redevelop the state information and cyber security so reality created today e-government digital transformation is not just a matter of, the, of the optimizing businesses increasing ac accountability providing more convenient services for citizens and general population or launching uh, or uh, in, improve anti-corruption mechanisms. Uh, we can say that e-services and digital transformation today have become the only platform for receiving services that is safe for human health. It is for the reason uh, that the importance and criticality of the risk associated with the security of services are increasingly significant and this should uh, uh, form the basis of uh, new risk assessment methodology for all governments. Um, unfortunately, we have other challenges in, uh, in this direction, especially in post-Soviet countries, security and especially information cyber security is increasingly considered to be the uh, fair, uh, sphere of activity of state security services, which from my point of view is fundamentally wrong and this come from the main this of secure, uh, it, it is, and this uh, idea why it's wrong, it comes from main, uh, um, main thesis of security, which implies that security begins with risk assessment. Risk assessment methodology related, for example, risk assessment methodology related to state secret has, a, uh, has, a be, uh, has have to be absolutely different to risk assessment methodology related, for example, public information or commercial secrets. If we want to uh, want stable and secure cyber uh, cyberspace, we must realize for all of us that this is the responsibility of all members of society, uh, government, governmental agencies, civil servants, businesses, NGOs, and citizens. I think this is the main role of government to facilitate this process and create such an ecosystem where all parties of uh, society will be able to understand their role and responsibility in a shared cyber cybersecurity ecosystem. So this is my my you know uh, uh, proposal to reevaluate uh, risks related to our infrastructure and second to just make as, it's as much as it's possible to involve all parties of society in cyber security and resilience of our information system. Thank you, Oleg. Thank you very much. And I think that uh, aligns well with uh, Rafael's uh, uh, keynote presentation about uh, that it's a comprehensive agenda which involves government, business, and society together. So thank you for your uh, remarks. We have time, uh, very, very limited time for the you know, a couple of questions, uh, you know, last round of, uh, you know, remarks from our panel. So I, I, I selected the following two questions. Uh, so one question would be for uh, Rafael and Melissa, and the other question would be for our country uh, partners um, uh, uh, who are present here. So the first question uh, is, uh, what uh, uh, three uh, main digital resilience uh, steps which each country should implement now. Now that we know what we know, what should each country be doing, uh, you know, as a priority, right? It's like a, it's a general, uh, uh, you know, uh, recommendation uh, which you can make to the countries, the top three things they should be doing right now, right? So that's a question for uh, Melissa and Rafael. Uh, and Iraqli, since you have both hats, uh, Georgia hat and a uh, global hat, you may also uh, respond to that. And the second uh, question is for our uh, country uh, partners uh, in uh, Central Asia. Uh, is uh, if you, uh, given that you know uh, what you know today about COVID and its impact, uh, what would you have done differently a year before COVID uh, to prepare better for you know for COVID uh, digital response to the, today? Like what what you could have done? Uh, you know one thing. You know, because we don't have time for more than one thing. So please choose one thing which you could have done uh, differently a year before COVID, uh, you know, given what you know today. So three things 
for Melissa and Rafael to mention without one minute per person, please. And we, this is like a final round. And uh, Irakli, you may choose to answer uh, you know, either of those two questions you have you are all here. So let's start with Rafal. You know, the three things uh, which each, each country should be doing today you know, on digital resilience, uh, given what we know about COVID impact. Yeah, th thanks, Oleg. I mean, it's a difficult question to answer simply because of the fact that the priorities are overlapping. Um, but I'd, I'd say that you know, the three things that, that to me are sort of top of mind in terms of best practices are as follows. First of all, you, you have to have situational awareness and a risk management framework so that you can identify and target those risks, threats, and vulnerabilities that are going to disrupt your digital systems. Um, that is essential because unless you actually have a way of measuring your exposure, responding to it is stochastic and disorganized. Secondly, I think the practice that has been borne out in both you know, G7 countries as well as others is that you really do need a centralized capacity for response. Uh, whether that's a computer emergency response team, a computer incident response team, um, a, a means of simply having a concentration of the workforce and expertise that can support critical services, that's pretty essential because at the end of the day, uh, digital resilience on its more technical uh, side really is dependent on what are called high value, low density skill sets. There are not a lot of people that know how to do it and concentrating them in one place and empowering them is critical to a effective all of government response. And I think the third thing is, is pretty self-evident is invest in people. Um, the reality is that cybersecurity and resilience uh, at the end of the day is dependent upon people who have digital skills and who understand digital hygiene. Um, without that, it's really difficult to be able to execute anything. And I think that that's a you know, pretty basic thing to say, much more difficult to execute. Uh, Melissa? Okay, well, thanks. I'll build on that. I think that um, it's really important for the country to determine um, uh, what, is, what are its top priorities economically or for the digital economy? And from there, the second thing is, is that the country then must conduct a comprehensive assessment that highlights the most critical digital dependencies, the companies, the services, the infrastructures and assets that if harmed would either disable or cause economic damage and national security consequences to that overarching strategy. And then third, um, you know, given the region that we're talking about now is that um, the digital economy has to be enabled by the telecommunications infrastructure. And if you only have a 40% penetration rate or a 60% penetration rate, you're never going to achieve the real opportunity of the digital economy. So you have to invest in telecommunications to the last mile. Okay. Thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, okay, Rakli, which question did you choose? Uh, the one or the three? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think three. So generally, I think um, uh, my recommendation will be for government to uh, invest. Okay, just you know, of who was in Georgia, we have a nice public service calls and just physical infrastructure for uh, delivery public services. My recommendation will be just invest more in digital services and less in physical infrastructure and plus educational education of uh, society uh, to uh, to make one, them able to using electronic services and awareness about electronic services and um, also i think it will be important to just uh, yeah generalize these two things thank you okay thank you <laughs> compromise uh now we will go now to our country uh, partners and start with Altenbeck. Uh, so Altenbeck, what is the one thing which uh, you would have done differently a year ago, uh, you know, or Kyrgyzstan could have done differently not knowing what you know today? I think that's a great question and it's really difficult to choose from. Uh, but uh, one thing that I would emphasize is education sector. Essentially, uh, building and capabilities to deliver education services through technologies and having high quality education provided as well so through these uh, technologies is one thing that I would pay uh, more attention. Thank you. Thank you, Altenbeck. Arman, over to you. 
Well, the one thing Kazakhstan, uh, you know, sh should have done a year ago. Now that we know today, what's happening? What's happening right now in Kazakhstan? You mean uh, right now? Uh, we we never see. Yeah. I I don't hear you. Uh, sorry, uh, Arman. If you were in your current job a year ago, before COVID, right? Uh, yeah. So what would you have done to prepare for the to manage the current crisis better? What is one thing which Kazakhstan you think should have done uh, a year before COVID? Yeah, uh, COVID is a very good lesson for for all of us, also for Kazakhstan, and. Uh, best proof of this that uh, is that uh, me I'm sitting <laughs> in new role right now in Zerze. I'm coming from business. It's uh, it's new cases, in new uh, uh, new experience for our government. And right now uh, we see our government is changing, changing, and uh, most of uh, important area for our digital programs is uh, healthcare education also of course and social programs this this three three things is most important right now okay thank you uh, arma uh, now uh, babur your last uh, word uh, for the panel today what is the one thing uzbekistan you think uh, could have done a year ago which would have prepared it today uh, to handle the covid-19 uh, response digitally yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, let, let me say that I'm very happy to hear that education is the most thing because uh, as I talked before, Uzbekistan already paying attention, so much attention to this sector only. And uh, uh, I think uh, if one year ago I would know that uh, COVID-19 is coming, uh, I would launch the assessment of the state's heads, for, for example, ministries and all the ministers, everyone, only according with their IT skills and awareness of uh, growing, uh, IT growing. It could just push their education. It, it will also be, be part of education, but uh, I think the ass assessment of them uh, only with the IT sector could push them a lot to, to, to this sector to, to be educated. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we have come to a conclusion uh, of the session. Uh, we are a bit late, but uh, not too late. Uh, I would like to you know, thank uh, all the uh, speakers today for excellent contributions, uh, very rich discussion over the last uh, hour or so. So we have heard uh, very diverse perspectives from global experts, from uh, country partners, uh, and they're very complementary and very mutually enforcing. So I think we all more or less on the same page on this important agenda. So we, I think we've heard loud and clear that digital resilience is a top priority today for our uh, country clients that, uh, you know, they learned uh, lessons a hard way uh, from the COVID, uh, you know, crisis. And I think today every country is investing heavily in digital infrastructure, digital transformation overall, and digital resilience is a key part of digital transformation. So I think, and the World Bank, of course, is here to help. So we are uh, supporting each of you uh, in your journey. Uh, and as was uh, mentioned uh, earlier, it's not, uh, digital resilience is not a single task. It's a journey which will last for a long time. And we need to keep fine tuning the strategy and uh, action plans all the time. And uh, we need to learn from each other because things are constantly evolving. So we need to, Constantly ask this question: What would have done differently today if we, if we, yesterday, yeah, if we knew what uh, we know today? So I think these are very important questions, and thank you for answering those uh, hard questions. And uh, I just wanted to reinforce that World Bank is here to work with all of you, and we have a strong uh, set of international experts, uh, you know, who are supporting uh, and beh behind us to support to all of you including, you know, uh, Melissa Rafal, Irakli, uh, and many others. Uh, so we, let's build that, you know, partnership for digital resilience for Central Asia and broader Eurasia. And uh, I hope, uh, you know, Kyrgyz Republic, which is one of the pioneers in this area, we're working with them very closely on setting up this Central Asia Digital Resilience Ac Academy and, uh, you know, providing a conceptual framework. So hopefully this will be soon ready for sharing with the broader Central Asia region. And we'll have another forum like this and discuss, you know, the results and uh, we'll uh, uh, start working more closely together on this agenda as a 
uh, Central Asia and as the Eurasian you know, um, community. So I'd like to thank organizers, um, our partners from Strategies, um, Anatoly and Tatiana for giving us this platform for discussion. Thank you so much. And we look forward to working with all of you on future events like this. Uh, thank you so much again. Uh, let's keep in touch. Bye bye. Thank you, Alec. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.